A deal is struck. Now what does it mean to you and the future of KCI, plus reliving our own blackface scandal and dissecting the rest of the week's most impactful news stories in this place we call home? Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marley Sporley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. I'm so grateful to have your company again this week as we track the local stories you may have missed and connect the dots on those headlines you may still be scratching your head about. Keeping tabs on those stories is the leader of the Kansas City Star editorial board, the former White House correspondent for the Wall Street Journal, Colleen Nelson, keeping abreast of the most important happenings in Kansas from the Shawnee Mission Post, reporter and editor Jay Center, from the studios of 41 Action News, reporter Stephen Dial, and political analyst, columnist, and star editorial writer Dave Helling. After months of uncertainty, a deal has finally been struck with the airlines on a new look KCI. A sticking point had been the price tag of $1.64 billion. The airlines have agreed to a scale-back number. Is $1.5 billion really that much less? Edgemore, the developer working on the new design, announced last August they were nixing plans for the two-story interactive fountain. That was one of the most iconic images in the redesign. What else will have to go to shrink down the price tag by $140 million, Stephen Dial? Well, they really didn't elaborate on that yesterday, but from some council members being concerned, asking, they were saying, oh, well, this doesn't mean you'll have fewer bathrooms or you won't have cell phone charger outlets. This means that they will scale back the design, so that can be a lot of different factors, but we what, didn't what get does a, that mean, a clear though? answer uh, uh, yeah. as to... It, it, does that right. mean it's smaller parking spaces, narrower waiting areas, Colleen? Right. They hadn't gotten far enough into the details to tell us exactly what they're taking away, so whether we're going to have one fewer charging station or a fewer parking, fewer parking spaces, we don't really know that, but this, as you say, this wasn't that much money. It was a pretty small sticking point that dragged this out for, for many months, and there's been a lot of frustration and so the fact that we finally have an agreement, we finally have a number, this is very good news for folks who want to see a new terminal at KCI. A standout quote this week, though, was from Scott Wagner, the city councilman, who said, I am not one to generally celebrate victory until I understand what the victory is. There were only six airlines saying yes to this agreement. Two more haven't said yes to this. Does that stop this from going forward? There is some dispute even about the six. I won't go into <laughs> okay. it. But basically, a majority of airlines have, uh, have said they will sign the term sheet by February 25th. Once that's in hand, the city council can finish its work on the development agreement with Edgemore, prepare to issue the bonds that we have turned in an important corner. Um, the reduction in price is kind of a meaningless thing, Nick. It was always going to be what the airlines were willing to pay, and they decided they're willing to pay between 112 and 116 million dollars a year from fees they get from passengers and other places. That provides a $1.5 billion house for Kansas City. That's what they're going to buy. They're going to get a 35-year mortgage, and the dirt should fly later this year. So ultimately, people want to see hard hats at the airport right. working on this. Does this agreement mean that this will, work will finally happen? Eventually, right? That's okay. what we all hope, right? They didn't say yesterday, they still didn't say when a shovel will go into the ground to uh, break ground. They told us how much it cost to demolish Terminal A and B and C, but we don't know when that shovel will go into the ground. The big other question is uh, the discussion next week as to will the city take out a loan to pay some immediate short-term expenses. That's also something people like Scott Wagner and others were opposed to saying if the airlines are paying for this, why can't the people waiting to be paid just wait? Now, while some people might find it remarkable that this whole project has taken so long, haven't other metro area projects that aren't even as complex as this taken even longer? Plans for a single terminal at KCI were first unveiled eight years ago. Contrast that with the 14 years it's been since the demolition of the Mission Mall in Johnson County that at one time was going to be the site of a destination aquarium, then the anchor to a new Walmart. Uh, now, Jay Center, they've ditched Walmart altogether. And it's now going to be an entertainment complex? 
Yes, it's a mixed-use development that's got uh, apartments, retail, a hotel. But the sort of unique draw to the area is supposed to be these two entertainment tenants. One of them's already been announced. It's a 40,000 square foot food hall that's being curated by Tom Colicchio, who people might know from uh, Top Chef. The other is a 90,000 90, square foot space. Um, the developer says that they have signed a, a, a tenant for it, but they haven't announced who it is yet. So uh, it should be several weeks. People are obviously, with all the fits and starts, uh, they, they'll believe it when they see it. But they say this is going to open in 2021? A part of it will open in 2021. It'll be phased in. The question will be, which will actually get built first, Dave Helling. <laughs> this is also the year that the airport is supposed to be finished, which was in 2021. Well, uh, is it going to be no. Mission Gateway, or is it going to be the well, airport? Well, Mission Gateway may not happen in my lifetime, okay. so we'll see. But the airport now is 2023, early 2023. Nick, it will be delayed that projects like this take longer than expected. My guess is mid-2023 will be a good target eventually. $1.5 billion will be the cost. I mean, I think one of the things that's so fascinating to me about the debate over the airport for, for the last eight years is the, the fundamental misunderstanding so many people have about how you borrow money for public projects, who's going to pay the cost, and how it's going to work. The, the decision of the airlines is so important because it puts those questions to rest largely, and now it's just a matter of paperwork to get going. As politicians appearing in blackface have now become one of the most talked about political stories of the week, the question many are now asking is, what should the consequences be, if any? Believe it or not, it's an issue we dealt with right here back in 2000, as Missouri's Democratic Governor Mel Carnahan was locked in a bitter U.S. Senate campaign against John Ashcroft. Photos surfaced of Carnahan dressed in blackface. He was singing in a blackface quartet in 1960, but Carnahan didn't resign. Colleen. That's right. So this happened a year out from an election. Carnahan was running for U.S. Senate against Ashcroft, and it was an interesting moment because Ashcroft was being called a racist because he had blocked the confirmation of a black judge to the federal bench. And so there were already there were already arguments that Ashcroft was a racist. Then the Republicans put out this photo of Carnahan in blackface, and everyone said, well, then Carnahan's a racist. So there was kind of a tit for tat. But there's some key differences here. I mean, this was a, a different moment in politics. Carnahan's photo was from the early 1960s, which was a, a different moment in United States history compared to what we're seeing in Virginia, photos from the 1980s. Um, but it, it caused a blow up in the U.S. Senate race briefly, but Carnahan was able to recover, and it really didn't change the course of events. I, I was pouring through some of the news clippings from that time. The Columbia Daily Tribune writing, is Carnahan a racist merely because he put on blackface? 39 years ago? Of course not. The Sykeston Democrat, a picture of Carnahan in a KKK robe? That would be a different matter, but a humorous portrayal that was not deemed inappropriate by 1960s standards has no place in election 2000. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch, while Mr. Carnahan's actions 39 years ago are detestable, they aren't necessarily the measure of the man today. And the Kansas City Star reports African-American clergy members from Kansas City and St. Louis downplaying the revelations. We are more interested in what has happened in the last 39 days than what has happened over 39 years ago. Would the response be different today, though, if this were Mike Parson or one of our mayoral candidates or someone in political office in Johnson County, Stephen? The response would definitely be different today. And in my opinion, in 2000, it should have been different. Uh, I think a lot of people missed the, the fundamental fact of the history behind blackface. It was an efforts to make and portray black people as unintelligent or lazy. And so whether someone did it 30 years ago or did it at Halloween last year, I think the, the sad part of this is we're still talking about this in 2019 of people not knowing uh, what's right and what's wrong, what's offensive and not. And so I think, you know, for people who are dressing up as Michael Jackson for Halloween, I think if you wear the sparkly glove and change your hair, people will understand who you're doing and uh, who you're trying to portray. I know uh, some people said, you know, this happened decades ago. Aren't we a forgiving country? I think that has a place um, in our country to forgive people for what they have done wrong. But I think the sad part is people not understanding that it is offensive. If it was a mayor in a town in Johnson County or a county official in Johnson County, would they be forced to resign today, you think? Uh, there would certainly be a lot of pressure on them to resign. I think there would be uh, a lot of scrutiny about their past actions. The other interesting thing about this is even if you're of a mind that, you know, in 1960 it was a different era and, you know, the awareness of, of how racist this was is maybe not as pervasive, anybody who's running for office now is going to who engaged in this kind of behavior would have done so within the last 20 or 30 years. And it, it, 
a lot less forgivable to to not understand the implications. Should it be left to the voters to decide this? Uh, well, no. Some some gestures are so offensive that they're disqualifying, and in the current environment, blackface would be that. That's why Governor Carnahan would be in much more trouble if those pictures surfaced today than they did in 2000. Now, Nick, you and I covered that race, as you recall. You brokered the only debate in that race between uh, John Ashcroft and Mel Carnahan. Your recollection, I'm sure, is much like mine. That was the bitterest race I think I've ever covered at the staff level. The Carnahan people hated the Ashcroft people. The Ashcroft people hated the Carnahan folks. The, the disclosure of the blackface photograph a year, more than a year before Election Day was a reflection of how angry everyone thought that race was going to be. And I do think it changed the nature of the discourse between the two because everybody looked at that and said, we cannot walk down this road or we will tear this state apart. So in that sense, it changed the Senate debate that year. The world has changed since then. It would be disqualifying today. This week, President Trump delivers his State of the Union address and calls for compromise and national unity. Newly elected Kansas Congresswoman Sharice Davids, dressed all in white and seated for most of the speech, got plenty of on-screen attention. She has said she wants to work in a bipartisan way to fix the country's problems. What evidence, though, is there that she's moving to the political center to work with Republicans, Jay? Well, in her response to the, to the State of the Union address, she said she was happy to hear President Trump uh, uh, express an interest in improving infrastructure, uh, in addressing cost of prescription drugs. Um, but that said, you know, she's been in office for a month and she was, the government was shut down for a big part of that. So uh, there's, there's not been a whole lot of opportunity to show where she stands. Colleen. Right. So we haven't got, had many tests yet for Sharice Davids, and, and certainly during the campaign, she talked about some things that she could work with Republicans on. She's still talking about infrastructure, which is the one thing that Republicans and Democrats keep bringing up as the mm -hmm. thing that they could actually work on, but we keep having infrastructure week and no infrastructure <laughs> action, and so it's kind of become a comical uh, line for anyone to talk about infrastructure at this point. Um, I mean, I think in general, you're going to see Sharice Davids siding with Democrats virtually all of the time, but it will be interesting to see if she could find a few issues where she could reach across the Jay app. mentioned that she's only been in office a month. Are there people who are waking up, though, in Johnson County, Wyandotte County, in that third district saying, hey, I'm going to take her on? I think if, if those people are thinking that they thought that the day that she got elected, um, like you mentioned, uh, she's only been in office about a month. The shutdown was going on. But one step that she has taken, I don't know if every Democrat uh, elected to uh, Congress would do this. She has met with everyone in the, the Kansas delegation, Pat Roberts, Jerry Moran, and others. I mean, that can be an olive branch. It could just be a photo op. We don't know right now. Like Colleen mentioned, it'll, it'll take those real votes to see if she's willing to be in the center. Now, during his State of the Union address, the president derided what he called drift towards socialism in the Democratic Party. Tonight, we renew our resolve that America will never be a socialist country. A Missouri state senator has now taken that to heart and introduced this week the Stop Socialism Act in Missouri. It would block local and state governments from competing with private businesses. How would this actually work, though, and what impact would this have on our local governments here in our metro, Dave? Uh, I'm not completely sure. Maybe if uh, the government decided to cut hair, barbers would be able to stake a claim to keeping the government out. It's much more symbolic than it is real, Nick. And in fact, the criticism of quote unquote socialism is much more political than it is about policy, although there are there is polling information that suggests younger voters are much more willing to see a government role in a lot of things in the United States. But the biggest the biggest program in the United States, the biggest domestic problem is social security. And so the idea that somehow the president or, or the Republicans in Missouri or Kansas or wherever are launching some big uh, rollback of government involvement in lives is probably much more about politics and symbolism than it is about reality. Now, if you thought, don't lawmakers have more important matters to deal with in Jefferson City than curbing socialism? Well, you're right, they do. Curbing the NCAA, lawmakers spent a hefty portion of debate time this week admonishing the college sports body for slapping postseason bans on MU sports teams after an investigation uncovered academic fraud. Mr. President, the NCAA is an antiquated, outdated bureaucracy 
whose benefits no longer outweigh the issues that it causes. The NCAA is an incompetent, inconsistent, fledgling entity. That's Columbia Area Senator Caleb Rowden, who went on to say that postseason sports ban could have a $10 million economic impact. I'm curious, though, what influence, if any, do Missouri lawmakers have on a national sporting body like the NCAA, Steve? I will say this. Um, there is wide um, focus in looking at the NTA when it comes to if you're not a blue blood school, the punishments are different. And I think uh, how MU took their reaction to them being punished is, you know, this wouldn't happen to some other schools. I think lawmakers, they can say all they want and, and, and complain and get mad and question the NTA for their decisions, which some of them are kind of suspicious, but there's too much money to be involved. Missouri, uh, uh, Mizzou moving to the SEC, just alone, they're not leaving. They're not going to. The state lawmakers aren't going to put a ban on the NCAA. In my opinion, there's too much money involved. So they have no role in this, then, uh, Colleen. They have no role. This is lawmakers venting. This makes them feel a little bit better that they've slapped down the NCAA. I think the one thing that is bonding Mizzou and KU fans at this <laughs> yes, moment is yeah. intense hatred of the NCAA. They they've uh, levied questionable punishments against both KU and MU in the last couple of weeks. And so I think this makes lawmakers feel a little bit better to stand at the podium and say bad things about the NCAA. So this is one of those Not rare instances of bipartisan on bi-state cooperation for Jay the first time, perhaps. Jayhawks and Tigers can All agree right. on this. Well, speaking of sports, the fan who flashed a laser on New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady during the last Chiefs playoff game has now been slapped with a lifetime ban from Arrowhead Stadium. Stephen Dial, if the infraction is considered so serious why wasn't the fan's name released i don't know that's a, just an easy question i, I have no idea why okay. does anybody know yeah, I, I don't either but <laughs> but it, you know it'll be interesting to see if they have identified this uh gentleman or general woman um whether or not there will be any sanctions applied legally whether there'll be some sort of legal case against the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator, and if there is, then we will know the name at that point. Well, we know we've been experiencing some really bad weather of late. That's something we do know, and it's no doubt had implications on you, whether it be from downed trees or branches, frozen pipes, power outages. But has it been that bad that one of the busiest courtrooms in our entire metro has been shut down for more than a week? And now we hear won't reopen until halfway through this month on February 19th. The Jackson County Courthouse closed because of water main break last Thursday. They say it's a 90-year-old building. Is the age of the facility the issue? Or is there something else going on here that we need to be concerned about, Colleen? Well, it's, it's an old building, and, and the water mains are breaking. And so, I mean, it's just... It, it, it kind of encapsulates a lot of things that are wrong with Jackson County government and the Jackson County Jail and the courthouse. And so um, I don't think there's a, a larger issue here, but uh, there's a lot of work to do and the infrastructure is old. So I, I, I might be wrong about this, but I can't remember a major public building like this being closed for so long with so many important functions taking place. Right, I Stephen. think the announcement of the February 19th or, or, or a few weeks from now kind of shocked a lot of people. It definitely shocked me. The building is really old. We hear about water main uh, breaks all over town. This just maybe puts a bigger spotlight on the fact that, hey, we need to ramp up or put some more funding into fixing things like this. President Trump makes it clear that his Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will not be leaving his cabinet to run for the United States Senate seat in Kansas, being vacated by Pat Roberts. Meanwhile, there are several news accounts this week that the nation's former health secretary, Kathleen Sebelius, may enter the race. She's a Democrat and a former Kansas governor. So what are we to believe? Are either of these people in this race, or should we not even care at this point, Jay? Uh, it's, it's very, very early, and so it's very difficult to say. I will also say that, you know, people have come and gone from the Trump administration after saying that they were staying put or, or going uh, more quickly. So especially with the Pompeo thing, I think we just have to kind of wait and see. It's very possible that he may be, you know, sort of uh, commissioned to, to run for the seat. Uh, Sebelius, I think, would be the Democrats' best candidate just based on name recognition, but there's a guy named Barry Grissom, who is the U.S. attorney, who has expressed interest as well. So they seem to have two at least pretty good viable candidates. Dave. Yeah, the Democrats would uh, be uh, flabbergasted if Kathleen Sebelius were to run. She would be instantly a competitive candidate in that race and maybe the favorite, depending who the, uh, on who the Republicans would nominate. Now, whether she wants to go through that or not is not clear. She's still active in Kansas politics. She recruited Laura Kelly to run for governor, uh, still has her roots here. But uh, a Senate campaign is grueling. It would be extraordinarily argumentative in Kansas. It would be massively 
expensive in 2020. Uh, so I'd give the chances, maybe a 10, 20 percent chance that she's a candidate in that race. We may hear of other Democrats who have an interest as well going forward beyond Barry Grissom. And potentially other Republicans, Chris Kobach oh, included. Though I did see Politico <laughs> announcing this week that he was at the border with Steve Bannon on a new effort to privately finance a new border wall. Is that a new full-time job for him or just a hobby? I think it's just a hobby, but he is looking for a full-time job. The, the promised Trump administration job has never materialized, and so he has some time on his hands to freelance and try to build, build this wall in, in his free time. But obviously, the, the Senate race is on his radar screen, and there are a lot of Kansas Republicans who are concerned that he could cost them a Republican Senate seat. And so there are a lot of Kansas Republicans who are working hard to dissuade Chris Kobach right, from jumping he, in the race. He's clearly wandering in the desert now looking <laughs> For something, literally. some were really literally were looking for a way to get on television. But you can talk to Republicans in Kansas, Nick, who are terrified of his candidacy. They think a Chris Kobach candidacy would be the only way that the 2020 Senate seat could be put in jeopardy. And they point to the governor's race, which is winnable usually for a Republican, was not this time. That's why you hear rumors about Pompeo and Kevin Yoder and Roger Marshall and all the other Republicans that may uh, make that race. And I think they're trying all to send a signal to Chris Kobach that you would not walk to that nomination. A new report on the state of retail in our metro is released. And the biggest headline, Nordstrom's move to the Country Club Plaza now represents an existential threat to the future of our city's most vibrant mall, Jay Center. It's not the only warning sign coming out of Johnson County this week, but let's start there. Some already claiming this might be the beginning of the end of Oak Park Mall. What are the experts saying? Well, so retail has faced all sorts of pressures over the past decade anyway. Nordstrom was the unique draw at Oak Park Mall. There are three other department store anchors there, but you know, there's a J.C. Penney and a Dillard's and a, a, a Macy's all over the place. So the loss of this unique draw is, is a big deal. You also have to look at the fact that like, even if you have these three other anchors in place, is that where the retail world is going in the age of, of the internet shopping and, and Amazon and, and so, so much? So um, it, the, the owner of the mall has said that this gives them a chance to reinvent it and, and make, uh, make it an attractive place to come for the next you know, several generations. But uh, what that concept actually looks like is, is a big question. Now, some are saying that it is not just the exit of Nordstrom that is the biggest threat to Oak Park Mall, but the series of shootings that we've experienced over the last year at, outside of that mall. And in fact, I did see the press release again this week from the Overland Park a police department having a community town hall on a rise in crime. You don't see that very often in Johnson County. I don't recall ever seeing that in Johnson yep. County. And yes, at Oak Park Mall over the past year, you've had two, you know, very prominent shooting events. Uh, in one North Johnson County neighborhood, or one Northern Overland Park neighborhood of 79th and I-35, essentially, you've had three very high-profile violent crimes over the course of the past two weeks, including the murder of a 17-year-old. Um, this meeting is, is to address those three crimes and see if the neighbors can come together and figure out a way to, to prevent it. Some say, though, it is not just what will Nordstrom's exit mean to Oak Park Mall, but will uh, Nordstrom save the Country Club Plaza, Dave? Well, the plaza, f the plaza, the plaza <laughs> faces the uh, <laughs> same challenges that all retail face, and that is it's 10 times easier to click at home to buy almost anything that you would want or could get at a, at a mass market shopping mall. So the plaza isn't exempt from the forces that are facing the Oak Park Mall, no matter how much you shuffle the stores around, which is why the plaza, by the way, seems to be trending a bit more toward entertainment options, restaurants, other things that you do have to go to or to visit to, to make it work. But as much as the shootings are an issue at Oak Park Mall, and they are, Retail is under pressure for reasons that are not related to violent crime. It's just, the world is changing. Gosh, we know that at the newspaper. And the way people buy things is changing dramatically. And so it's not clear what a mall can do to maintain what they have been in the past. And Johnson County itself is changes. Others are speaking out about that, too. I see Adam Hamilton, the founding pastor at Church of the Resurrection, telling Overland Park officials that Johnson County beige is going to hurt the community's progress. Young adults, he says, want and expect diversity. They may want, not want to live in Johnson County if it doesn't have more options for housing and transportation. His own children, he says, have resisted moving back into Johnson County beige for those very reasons. Was his characterization met with nodding heads 
heads or eye rolls? I think Overland Park officials get it. So his comments came uh, as the city released the uh, uh, results of this year-long planning process called Forward OPP. Um, and basically he was saying, listen, uh, cul-de-sacs and McMansions are not what people who are becoming adults, young adults right now, uh, are looking for and where they're going to live. Um, people on the city council at, at that presentation said, we understand, we know we're going to have to get there, and basically colleagues on the city council, you're going to have to show some backbone because these changes are hard, there will always be people upset, lobbying against them. Um, we need to see, show some, some strength and, and push them forward. When you head to the polls, how important is a candidate's political party in deciding how you vote? Former Kansas Independent candidate Greg Orman ran a series of ads trying to convince voters that was a poor way to make important decisions. The mayor of Kansas City doesn't run as a Democrat or a Republican. In fact, most local elections, they don't even list the party the candidate belongs to. But is that about to change in Johnson County, where there's now a push to end nonpartisan elections, Jay? Uh, Mike Brown is the commissioner who's, who's uh, pushing this, um, and it, it got uh, five votes. It got a lot closer to passing than uh, people expected it to when it came up before the, the board last month. Um, the, the idea here is that uh, Democrats were very involved in the election of two county commission members. It's worth pointing out, though, Republican or candidates for the county commission have been putting elephants on their signs and showing their allegiance okay. to Republicans. So, Stephen, well. there are 11 candidates running for Ooh, mayor of Kansas City. Wouldn't it be easier for folks if they knew if they were a Republican or a Democrat? In a way, in my opinion, I think so because uh, some people would. Uh, both parties have certain political views when it comes to certain issues that matter the most to people, and so maybe if you put the parties on there, maybe it might make someone focus more on another person or a different candidate. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the pages of your Kansas City Star, Colleen Nelson, and from 41 Action News, Stephen Dial. From the Shawnee Mission Post, Jay Center, and the stars, Dave Helling. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.